Welcome back to our classroom. Hey, folks, if you don't know, I have the Home Collective with me. You better get with it. These individuals are doing great work in the community of Lawrence, Massachusetts, and beyond. Cassie Infante and Marianela Rivera. That's right, people. Get with the program. You about to get schooled on civics and supporting young folks and being community activists. We're going to squeeze it in here. All right, we're going to squeeze it in, but you can't get everything in this short episode of our classroom, so you're going to have to follow up with them. I'm telling you now, and I'm telling you early, follow Home Collective at HPL underscore collective. I'll remind y'all again on the back end of things, but you'll find them on Instagram, LinkedIn, and Facebook. Welcome, Cassie and Marianela. Gracias. Thank you so much for having us here. We're so excited, especially to be with our Lawrence family, being community. We're we're really happy and we're, we're just so excited. Yeah, same. Thank you so much. It's our pleasure. It's our pleasure. Well, we're not going to waste time. Let's get right into it. Why don't you tell us a little bit about the Home Collective? I know, but some of my listeners don't know, and they need to learn about the wonderful work that you're doing. Absolutely. So Marianella and I are scholar activists, community organizers, community-based educators. We've also worked within classrooms and schools. And, you know, we founded Home Place Collective because we really wanted to further our equity and justice work in education through the lens of civics. And so what we do is we work with schools, um, nonprofits, um, any institution that serves young people, and we really help them develop what we call transformational civic skills. And so we're talking about how do we help our young people build the world that we want to see? How do we get them involved in, in civics within their own communities? How do we build youth power? Well, that really starts with supporting the adults that, that support young people. And so that's the work that we do. We really build adult capacity to um, to work with young people. And it's all about, you know, raising the next generation of democratic citizens and activists and doing that responsibly in an equitable way. Would you add anything, Marino? No, I think, you know, really it's based of, it's our Home Place Collective is based off of our lived experiences, being uh, school committee members um, in Lawrence, Massachusetts, uh, in a district that's been under state takeover, for over a decade now. And so seeing how disenfranchised our community has become as a result of it is really showing the need to, to really build up the next generation of, uh, of youth activists. Well, let, let's stay in that place because through, through your work with HPC, focusing on raising the next generation of democratic citizens, what, what does that mean exactly? Can you define what it means to be a democratic citizen in the 21st century in the United States. Absolutely. And I, I think Marinella bringing, bringing our story into it is a perfect segue. You know, we, we felt in our lived experience that democracy was not playing out in our own community, or at least there was a system that was facilitating undemocratic um. Uh, outcomes, right? So, so people in the in our hometown of Lawrence were not able to vote for school committee members that that represented and led their schools. And so that example taught us, um, you know, the United States in general, even in our own community, we are so far from the ideal democracy that we want to see. And so for us, you know, a democratic citizen is someone who uh, knows and understands their political power and is enthusiastically engaged in political processes. And that can be in and outside of electoral politics and in, inside, in or outside of government. And there are so many levels and layers to government, right? So for us, our entry point was local politics and government. Um, and that, that was truly transformative. But for us, you know, a democratic citizen is a change maker. They're, they're a critical thinker and an activist, ultimately. An activist uses their voice as a tool for social change. And I think the, the, the point here around protecting democracy is really understanding that, you know, the political and economic systems around us have historically 
uh, excluded so many of us, particularly if you're Black, Indigenous, people of color, it really has excluded us. It continues to exclude us. And we can see that in, you know, voter suppression, institutions like receivership, right, where like our vote is not actually doing anything to affect um, the representation of our schools and so much more. Is What would you add, Mary Noah? Uh, well, what I would add to that is like nowadays, um, given education reform efforts, you know, the teaching to the test, I think now more than ever, it's critical um, to really build up democrat democratic citizens so that we, we save this experiment called democracy, right? Like when public education was first um advocated for in this country it was to really create an educated populace and right now with the the, the battle right with against like critical race theory and um you know not knowing facts from fiction like how do you decide for a reliable uh source it's really critical for our youth to be educated in such a way that they are critical thinkers and that they're able to engage in the in this democracy so that we continue to protect our our democratic rights and our freedoms, right? Because we're at a point where we're seeing our democracy erode and it's happening at the school committee level. Um, so it's really important to engage our students in the in, in this political discourse and to get them engaged as they're transitioning, you know, from high school to adulthood and they're registering to vote, that they're really being engaged in an authentic way. Yeah, I love that. The notion of zeroing in on supporting their development of critical thinking skills, definitely essential, and also helping them understand how they can make a greater impact for social change. And so how can we as adults support positive youth development in their quest for social change? What does this look like in school setting, community, home? Because I think all those areas, there are responsibilities in which we as adults need to show up and help guide our young people. Absolutely, absolutely. And, you know, I think for us, there's two main points. The first is we need to prioritize civics education. Right now, a big part of why we started Home Place Collective is because, you know, Marianella mentioned the push around testing. So often, in particular, our educators are not being being um, uh, sort of trained and, and educated around um, issues of civics because there's so much emphasis from a professional development perspective on um, English and mathematics, which, of course, is really important. Um, but that often means that that civics and humanities educators or social studies teachers don't necessarily get the support they need. Um, and so and so for us, we really need to prioritize civics. And that means, um, you know, within schools, we need to, first of all, teach accurate and culturally relevant history, <laughs> um, because when marginalized students know about the his their history and they know about the stories of resistance, for example, they are moved and inspired to action. They understand that there is unfinished work. And I think, you know, specific examples of that include social movements and activism history that have really shaped who we are today and that continue to shape that. I think about in Lawrence, for example, there's some great, there's some amazing educators who bring in conversations about labor rights and they bring in the bread and roses strike that happened in Lawrence. I'm thinking about, you know, conversations about the movement for Black Lives, Black Lives Matter and discussions of in context with the civil rights movement and how that journey has continued. I think that's really important. Um, and then not just within um, history and humanities, any educator or anyone that works with youth in schools can really encourage inquiry-based um, learning and conversations. Um, having equitable socio-political discourse is so important. So choosing not to shy away from those conversations and really seeing and understanding that almost everything is inherently political, right? Education, education, how, where, and why students learn, those are all political decisions. And that can be a little bit intimidating, but having, choosing to have discourse over debate, we were really big on that. Discourse over debate on any topic is really important. Um, and then the last thing I would say is, you know, providing place-based learning opportunities within communities. 
we do a lot of work around critical participatory action research, which is basically um, a way for marginalized people, in particular young people, um, to lead inquiry and research within their own community on an issue that's directly affecting them. And so this really pivots what we think of research as, which is like outside sort of experts coming in and researching said subjects. This is really about letting youth take the lead. Um, and then I'll let Marinella talk about uh, what about like in our community could we do? Uh, well, in our communities, specifically our, our nonprofits, um, many youth are put in positions where they're feeling tokenized um, and used as decoration. So it's really important that we confront the adultism that happens because um, the, the, the youth are the most disenfranchised. They don't have a say or a vote in terms of what happens to their to their education and thereby what affects them in terms of their future and success. And so it's really important that we confront adultism that happens in those settings. Um, and then in addition to that, I mean, we really need to talk about, cause it's a village, right? And so we need to talk about what happens in the home. And oftentimes, you know, there's this, like, we don't talk about politics at the, at the dinner table for fear of getting into these arguments. And so, you know, um, creating a, a, an environment in a setting within the home that is a safe space where we can talk about our different viewpoints and our different lived experiences and talk about you know the issues the societal issues that are affecting us and what are ways we can engage um you know within our communities to help you know really um you know resolve those issues so i think those you know um those are ways in which um you know we can address that yeah, and I wanna, oh, go ahead go ahead no, I was going to say, I'm, I'm curious to know if, if y'all do trainings or offer opportunities to help folks understand how to develop those type of rhythms within their households, right? Because of what you said, because of the fact that sometimes there's this whole, you know, we're not going to talk about politics, or maybe there's just one person talking, you know, but how do we normalize the conversation around what's happening on the political front and, and not just on the national level, right? Let's let's also talk about what's happening locally. And often locally is, is where we gotta have more of this discourse. So I'm curious to know if you offer trainings or or there are guides to support families in actually developing this kind of rhythm, setting this type of environment in their household in which it is a norm for us to engage in these political conversations and to think about how we strategically approach issues that impact all of us. Absolutely. We do offer trainings and I would say, you know, those trainings are really informed by our community and family engagement work that we've done through our school committee role, um, as well as in our local community organizing efforts. I think we also, you know, we also work with a number of nonprofits who are struggling in terms of their parent engagement, for, for example. And so they're thinking about how do we get parents engaged in this specific social issue that we're looking to fix um, within the community. I know Lawrence, for example, is a, is a community that has a lot of nonprofits doing good work in the areas of community and social change. And so it's really about finding those pathways um, for involvement that makes sense. Because I think, you know, we talk about like mo part modeling participation for the young people in our lives at any level that's feasible, right? And so it could be as simple as, um, speaking up, calling folks into conversations when you see instances of bias or racism at the Thanksgiving dinner table, for example, like, mm -hmm. and even talking about what is Thanksgiving? Why are we here? And talking about like the historical analysis behind that. And so we really encourage parents to see that as a form of activism as well, that it doesn't always have to be, um, sort of the the external showing up that process or, yeah mm -hmm. like i think when we talk about activism we have to deconstruct that term as well because so, for so many they think of protest they think of direct action which is absolutely an important part um, of activism and has shaped us historically but for us also activism is too doing the inner work right um becoming a little bit more critically conscious having more root cause analysis either in the classroom or at home one of the best ways to do this that we've seen at home in particular, because you asked about parents, is using literature and, and diverse media sources to have conversations. You don't have to be a subject matter expert. 
It's just as simple as asking your young person, what do you think about this? What do you notice? What feels, you know, relevant to, to our hometown? Um, and then, you know, gradually working your way to conversations about power. I think that for us has been, that seems to really be a catalyst for young people is talking about who do you notice, you know, has power? What is the power structure in this movie? And how does that influence the way they move in the world and, and what's happening? And so using books, you know, Netflix show, whatever you're watching, like there's always a conversation to be had. And, and you know, you don't have to be an expert or know everything to have it. Mm. Yeah, you know, it makes me, there's a couple of things that y'all said that's really resonating with me. The one was earlier, the term was used discourse over debate. And I talk about this a lot with different guests, the fact that our, our, there's so much tension in our country, there's so much divide, and there's a lot of folks who are yelling or talking and not listening, right? We should be able to come to the table, even if we're in disagreement, we should at least be able to engage in a discourse, right? So I love that framing of discourse over debate. And if you don't create a t-shirt out of it, I will. Oh, <laughs> on it, on it. Okay, okay, okay. I'll pump the brakes. Um, but yeah, there's a there's, there's a lot of rah, rah, and, and not enough LPR. And LPR is listen, res, listen, process, respond. Hmm. Listen, process, respond. I just came up with that, by the way. Okay, you really? Put it on a T-shirt. I thought that was a framework. I thought that was a framework. I, was like, uh, I already started. I already started in my notes. <laughs> but seriously, you know, folks, we have to do better in terms of engaging as active listeners and not being so quick to do what people do on social media, which is like, yo, I'm gonna be a keyboard warrior. You know, I'm a. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm shooting them up with my comments. You know, just listen. It's okay. Like somebody has a different perspective. And, and maybe, maybe it's even something that's way off. But listen, right? Listen first and then let's try to understand, like, all right, what's really being said here? Where, where where's it coming from? And then yeah then you might want to respond. And I say might because I don't think we got to respond to everything. I think we right. I think we've developed a habit in our country where people feel the need to have a comeback for everything. Oh, I got to clap back and I got to clap now. And whoever claps the loudest also gets the most attention. Right? Whether we're talking about a tweet that somebody puts out or or something on IG or whatever the case may be. And so True. I love this notion of discourse over the debate. So thank you for, for naming that. So the Home Place Collective helps educational institutions, community spaces, and nonprofits drive social change by, as you said, building transformational civic skills and critical socio-political literacy. What are three action steps in this area that we could all implement to drive social change and ultimately build transformational civic skills and critical social political literacy. Absolutely. And I know those are big terms. So I feel like I should we gotta break them down a little bit. I know bit. we gotta we gotta <laughs> define them a little bit because I, I don't know that I did that yet. But you know, for us, transformational skills means that we know how to change the systems around us to deliver more equitable outcomes and to, to have a world of justice that we want. Navigational versus navigational is really just, you know, teaching our young people how to navigate the world the way it is, you know, even though we know it's unjust, right? And so for mm -hmm. us, a part of what motivates us is knowing there's so many amazing services, for example, and nonprofits doing work around college readiness, job readiness, those things are really important. And they are insufficient in the sense that they're not necessarily teaching young people how to be change makers, right? How to be that democratic citizen. And so for us, we really feel um, about, you know, instilling transformational skills 
And those are those are all of the topics that we've talked about so far in a sense. But I think when we think about like the three things, Marinelle and I were talking about it, like for us, it has to start with self because transforming yourself and, and really and, and and really thinking deeply uh, of of removing sort of these systems of oppression that have become so normalized, um, it, it that's internal work. You have to be able to see the systems before you can change them and take action. So the first one I'll talk about is is develop your inner activist. Like that's for that's the number one step. What fires you up? What is the issue that you want to work on? And it could be very simply, you know, learning more and understanding about it. Um, there's this great activity called Mapping Your Role in Social Change. That's a resource for everyone that they can find on the internet. Um, and that talks about how you can be the fire, you can be the person at the protest, but you can also be the light. You know, you can be, um, you can be the person who is calling folks in in your family and having more critical discussions. So, um, you know, becoming a little bit more critically conscious around issues of injustice, finding the root cause, finding the system. Another great resource, this book is Anti-Racist, 20 Lessons on How to Wake Up and Do the Work by Tiffany Jewell. I wanna shout out Tiffany Jewell. That book is amazing. And so I think doing the self-work is one step. Um, it's the step. Think? It's yes. the step. It's the first step. And I want to say why, because it goes back to that quote, like if you want to change the world, you have to first start by changing yourself, right? And so everybody has implicit biases. Everybody has them. So you really have to check them and do that internal work and be able to, you know, help facilitate the development of your own critical thinking skills. Because, you know, for us, it didn't develop until we went to graduate school. Like I really was just com completely like, you know, smoke and mirrors. Like I just, I was living in a world where I didn't think that racism existed. Like, cause I thought, cause that's the way they teach us in school, right? Like after the civil rights move in and, you know, like everything was good after that. Right. And, um, but then when my, I, I became awakened and I really, un I understood what was happening in the world. And I started critically thinking around the social injustices that were happening around me, that's when I started to develop those skills. That's when I ran for office and started engaging in social justice movements. So that's like the step. It's like number one to do the self-work. The next step I would say is um, within your community is building relationships with your elected officials at all levels. Um, you know, oftentimes you know, the only time we engage in civics and like, I'm just going to keep it real. is like, we vote for the president every four years. Like most people just like, that's the time when they engage in governance. Right. But in reality, you should be developing relationships, especially if you have kids in school, you should have relationships with your school committee members and understand, you know, budget season and, you know, how to advocate for school policies to better support, you know, the success of your child, you know, with their education you know, your city council members, you know, and not even just to reach out to them when there's a pothole in the city, you know what I'm saying? But like when something's affecting your neighbor, it might not necessarily affect you directly, but if it affects your neighbor, you should feel like it's something that affects yourself because it's affecting the neighborhood and, and the energy and the space around you. So I think it's really, really critical to develop those relationships with your elected officials so that you can help to advocate for the change that's needed locally and at a statewide level as well. And I would just add to that, um, if you are so inclined, um, I think for folks that feel space, that feel safe, excuse me, and have the capacity, you know, there's so much work that we mentioned this earlier, there's so much that happens outside of government, and that's at the community organizing level. And I think especially in recent years, there's more conversation and public dialogue about transformative justice, right? And these transformative skills that we're talking about. Well, we're talking, there's a lot of work happening around community-based solutions, mutual aid networks is a great example of that. Um, and, and so there are really sort of non-traditional ways to be involved civically that really speak to building off of the assets that are in communities that are really rooted in relationships and relationship building and, 
and really moving towards um, you know, equity, justice, and liberation. And so there is something for everyone. And, and more than anything, we just want to encourage some type of participation. I think Marianella brings up a good point about the voting. Like it's so much no, more than voting. It's real. <laughs> like we gotta talk about that. Like it's more than just voting every four years for the president. <laughs> no, no, absolutely. That's good stuff right there. And you know, I I think that. <clears throat> It's important to ask this type of question because I want people to be able to take tangible action steps and implement them right away. And so definitely, definitely important for us to be self-aware, develop relationships with local government officials, and also uh, move towards action that's centered on justice. And so I want to, um, I, I, I want you to, well, let's pivot a little bit. I want to think about people that you respect. And if you had the opportunity to have lunch with any scholar, activist, or community organizer, who would it be and why? Yes. And so I I I chose someone who is no longer with us. I hope that's okay. No, we were wondering if this yeah. question was like dead or alive. It's it's potential. <laughs> yes, yes. It's it's always that are alive. I, I just, <laughs> I just. Original answer, if you want to. It, I knew it. I knew it. I, knew I, it. I, I didn't write it down this time for whatever reason. I just missed it. But yes, it should. Oh, that's okay. I I love it. I know. I know. We we pay homage to our ancestors and this work, right? I think activism is so deeply rooted in our ancestral resilience as people of color, and I think that's beautiful. Um. I think for me, I'm gonna go with um, Bell Hooks. May she, may her soul rest in peace. Um, she passed away recently. We are actually named after her. So Home Place Collective comes from um, an essay that Bell Hooks wrote called Home Place, A Site of Critical Resistance. And in it, she talks about how um, enslaved people built their own home places as places where they could you know, where they could self-determinate and where they could matter and love um, in ways that the outside world denied them. And I and that really felt um, instrumental in us uh, as, as a place that we really want to build these types of sites of resistance everywhere, whether it's in ourselves, in our schools, in our homes. And I think just broadly speaking, you know, Bell Hooks, really talks about love as an ethic in her activism. And, and she did a lot of uh, work disrupting higher education around her Black queer feminism work. And, and that feels really salient. She did things like disrupt um, graduation speeches that she was invited to. She would use those opportunities to you know shed light on injustice. And I think that's really neat to, to sort of forge your own spaces of activism, um, even in a thing like a commencement speech. So that's who I would pick. And I would pick Dr. Dr. Angela Davis. And the reason is because while I was a school committee member, um, I was labeled as radical uh, and I was politically ostracized for uh, advocating for a uh, return of local control of our schools, because as a school committee member, I was, I was doing the research, I was advocating for evidence-based policy, I was uplifting the voices of my constituents, and I was constantly hitting walls. Um, and so I was very frustrated in that regard, and so I was constantly seeking um, inspiration. And uh, I came across Dr. La Dr. Angela Davis's quote, um, you know, radical simply means grasping at the root. And so when I was labeled radical, I took that as an honor after reading that quote, because I knew I was trying to grasp at the root of things. And I was I was trying to be um, the school committee member that my constituents elected me to be. Um, and I really leaned on her um, and everything that she's done for support in my activism work. I mean, the fact that she was on the FBI's most wanted list <laughs> and then she defended herself in court. Yeah. I mean, like I could go on and on about her, but like, she's <laughs> definitely a, a big source of inspiration, uh, for me and someone I would, you know, love the opportunity to have lunch with. Yeah, absolutely incredible. I mean, the fact that Angela Davis is still alive. How about that? Yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah, and absolutely. We we know that uh, some of these agencies have knocked off some of our most powerful leaders. Um, so the fact that she's still alive is a testament yeah. to, to her resilience. Absolutely. So for those that are listening, what is a message of encouragement you want to offer them? Ooh, I would say um, change is possible. Another world is possible. And that is not my quote. I just want to say that. I think it was um, uh, someone named Arundhati who, who said that. But um, your voice is your power. Use it in any way that makes sense for you, in any way that you feel safe. Um, but just know that challenging the status quo is is the right thing to do for justice and equity and change is possible. That's those are my words. Those are super inspiring words, <laughs> Kathy. I hope so. I love it. I think my my encouragement, um, you know, especially for those seeking to, to uh, start activism work, and they might be in a space where like no one's speaking up, and they feel compelled to speak up, but there's that like inherent fear. That what if they speak up, they might be retaliated against. I know that fear because I experienced it. And so what I would say to that is, is you know, don't be afraid to, to speak up and, and live your truth, right? Um, and share your lived experiences because what I've experienced from pushing past that fear is meeting some amazing people and being able to create community and organize um, for education justice, because, you know, I wasn't afraid to speak my truth. I met my best friend, Cassie, uh, because I was, you know, walking in my truth and really fighting for education justice in Lawrence. So, you know, for those of you out there who are witnessing injustices, but are afraid to speak up, let me tell you, there, there's beauty behind pushing past that fear. Um, you will be able to organize a group behind you because they'll see you speaking up and they'll be inspired by the work that you do and they'll want to join you in your efforts. So that's what I would Ooh, say. I'm about to cry, like, <laughs> like happy tears. <laughs> yes, yes. This space for all of that. Thank you for sharing that. Respect the work that y'all been doing and for serving as role models for the community and beyond in terms of the need for us to be present on school committee boards and whatnot like that that's something that we got to continue to talk about think about and uh and really encourage others to do the same so uh we'll circle back to how we started folks you can follow the home place collective on instagram linkedin and facebook at hpl underscore collective hpl underscore collective do so today help amplify the work that they're doing and extract knowledge from what they are offering y'all be blessed thank you very much thank you